5.5 introduces to us 2D and 3D pathfinding algorithms that allow us to go from one spot to another and create a full path, whether it's through points, as you see here, or through splines. And not only that, but they can avoid pathways, if you so wish, and find the most optimal or slightly off optimal path to get from one location to another so you can get some variation and interest between them. So let me go over how pathfinding works in 5.5 and I'm going to give you a little sneak peek of how I'm planning to use this system to create a procedurally generating 3D dungeon with specific lengths of rooms connection and other things like that, hopefully be coming sometime in the future. Let's get into it. To get started with 5.5 PCG, go to edit plugins and make sure you've turned it on by searching for PCG and turning on PCG content generation framework and restarting your engine as needed. Once you have PCG enabled, you can go ahead and right click, go to PCG and grab yourself a PCG graph. For this one, I'm going to call it PCG 2D pathfinding. And then I'll go ahead and just drag this right into our environment and then open it up. So to get started, we're going to need some points just to work with. And to make it easier, I'm going to search for create grid to get ourselves a create points grid. And then in the details panel here, I'm going to change the coordinate space from global to local components. So it follows the actual location of our volume. And I'm going to change the extents here to something like 2000 by 2000. The Z does not matter because we don't care about it in this scenario. And then if I press the D key to debug it, you can see that we now have a large area here where we now have our points. Now they're a little bit hard to see. So from here, I'm going to get ourselves an extents modifier, and then I'm going to change it to multiply and set extents to 0.9 in every direction and then sample the extents instead. So this way we could just see a very definitive line in between all of these points. In fact, it's still a little bit hard to see because it is very emissive. So I don't want the auto exposure to mess with what I'm looking at and can continuously go darker and brighter. So under lit, I'm going to change off game settings so it no longer fluctuates to being brighter or darker. It is just always consistently at this brightness. But now how do we get it to actually navigate? How do we get it a path? Let's say I want a path from the first point to the last point, and I want to just find a path between them. Now, before it would have been difficult, you need to figure out some algorithm, but now it's a lot simpler. Now the pathfinding node gets you an A star pathfinding algorithm built into it. Now with this node selected in the details panel, we can take a look at some things. The surge distance is a thousand. This is how far does it look between each point. Now in our case, on the create points grid, where cell size is 100. So I actually want to change the pathfinding to search 100 units in length. So that way it only finds the closest unit. It doesn't find things further away. But if you wanted to skip some spots, it can absolutely do that. But if you want a perfect continuation, then you want to keep the sizes the same and they'll find you all the connected points right along your path. You have the option to manually place in your start location and your goal location. You can also have them be as inputs, which is what we're going to be using in just a moment. Heuristic weight, as it describes here, estimates a faster path to speed of processing, a higher than one heuristic weight can be faster, but it sees to being optimal path. Weight of zero is essentially flood fill. So by default, I'll be just leaving this at one as it works for us at the current moment. The cost function node can go by distance, so we'll just find the shorter path. It can also use a fitness score, so it'll be driven by a fitness score, which you can pipe in yourself, or it can go off a cost multiplier, so some things will cost more or less. So the fitness one is zero to one, and the cost multiplier is above one. You can do it in different ways. Basically, you could have it be, oh, I'm going to randomize the value between all the points, zero to one, make it easier on yourself, or if you want, I want this next point to be cost 20 and the one next to it is costing five. So this gives you different options for this. You can also use path traces, which we'll get into shortly, except a partial path and output as a spline if we wanted to. In our case, I'm going to actually not output as a spline. I'm going to use a regular points data here. But if you want to, you can absolutely use it as a spline. You need to change the spline from linear or curved and then use a spline sampler from there. If you want to use it for, let's say, find the shortest path, and then spawn a road along it. You can absolutely use it for such things. I'll go ahead and uncheck output a spline, and I'm going to check on start location as input and go location as input. And this gives us two inputs here. Now I'm going to plug in the extents modifier for in, and now we need to get a start and go. Now I wanted to go from the first point to the last point. That makes it really simple because all we need to do is use a attribute filter. In our case, I want to make sure that the operator 
is set to equals. The target attribute instead of last is going to be index. And we're going to use a constant threshold instead of an attribute. So we're going to check that on. And we can just leave it on double or you could sell it to be integer of a value of zero. So as long as the index is zero, as long as the first one, then we want to start there. And we'll say inside filter, we'll go ahead and put it into the start. And for the goal, we want the last one. So we can actually reuse this, but in this one, we want to reverse the order of our points. So I'm going to drag out, I'm going to search for sort attributes, and we want to sort it, set it by last, we want to sort it by index, and ascending is normal because you go 0, 1, 2, 3, but instead we want descending. And so it reverses the order of all our points. I'll plug that into our attribute filter, and again, same settings as before. We want to make sure its index is equal to 0, so it's the last point now. And that will be our goal. And one last thing we want to do is we want to check on copy originating points when you're doing a point path, not a spline path. So that way it takes our original points and just copies it all along the path. So I check that on. And then if I go ahead and debug it with a D key, you can see we now have a path from one corner to the other. Now it's still a little bit hard to see. So I'm going to change the color and the size of the extents here. I'm going to change the extents modifier instead of 0.9 to something like 0.75. And instead of sampling this point, I'm going to drag out a debug node. And on the debug node, I'm going to go to material override and I'm going to search for PCG red and grab ourselves a PCG debug red material. This is the same thing as pressing the D key and getting this icon, except it is just going to take it from this path and apply this material to the points. So as you can see, we now have this nice path. You can see it is pretty diagonal as best as it can. It tries to find the simplest path, but it's not very interesting, right? It is technically the simplest, but what if you wanted the simplest path, but you wanted it to go maybe a little bit around, a little bit more interesting. Well, then we can start using the cost function mode. Instead of distance, I'm going to change it to a fitness score. Now it has the maximum fitness penalty factor, and has the cost attribute as an input. Now, if I open it up, we can see we get a lot of options here. And you can find the cost attribute near the top here, which is what we wanna use to, but you don't have to actually plug anything in. You can just specify an attribute right in here. And that's what we're gonna do. For a cost attribute, I'm actually going to use density. Now, all the densities are currently the same for everything. So here at the very beginning, I'm going to do ourselves a density noise. I grab myself a regular density noise, which is an attribute noise set up for density. Between zero and one is completely fine for us. And I'll go ahead and plug it in right before the extents modifier. So now with the pathfinding set to density for the fitness score, well, you're now getting a different kind of result. It is no longer straight diagonal. It is going around here. Now, if I move it around a little bit, you can see it will generate a new one every single time based on the randomness of that node. So that's great. We now have a more interesting pathway. It's no longer just a straight line, but what if you had a wall here? Let's say I had these walls and I did not want it to go through these walls. Well, how do we get it to go around, but still go from one point to the other? To do that is very simple. We can start using the path traces. So if I check this on, it will now start using path traces to avoid things. But how does this path tracing work? It's using the data down here. If I open filtering, we have a few options. We can ignore PCG, we ignore back faces, we ignore self in case you want to not be hit by its own things. If it is doing something previously that generates walls, but you didn't want to ignore them, you can absolutely can. And you can include or exclude landscape. Now this is all fine for filtering, but under advanced is where we set the collision and the type where trace we want. So the collision channel is static. Well, that seems good for us in this case. And if we come over here, you can see it has now moved the points around these walls. And if I go ahead and move this to the right or left, it will go ahead and just move itself around the points as best as it can. And it will automatically grab multiple walls. So if I go ahead and just make a few more adjustments here, let's say I wanted to actually just only go to the last point from all the way from the right here, but I wanted to also then come from this corridor. Let's say we had a corridor, we wanted to go around through this area and then back around. Well, I've now reshaped my walls. I can select our PCG graph, clean up and regenerate it. And now we see one problem. Our grid doesn't go actually to the end of the extents. So all of a sudden we have a partial path. Now you might not want this. And if you don't want it, you can turn off accept partial path. When you do this, if it fails to find a situation where it has found points in this scenario, it will not generate any points, which means that you can actually filter out whether it contains any data to tell has your path successfully been generated or not. And you can filter it based off of whether it is empty or not. In our case, I'll go ahead and use partial path for demonstration. And the only thing I'm going to change here is I'm going to move this so it can go ahead and fit right around here. And then I'll go ahead and do another cleanup 
and generate. And you can see it is moving all the way around these points around all the walls and it is going to our current location. Again, the path is not completely straight because we have added a little bit of noise. For comparison, if I change it back to distance, you can see we get a completely straight, perfect path from one spot to the other as best as I can. So I'll go ahead and change it back to fitness score using our density. And again, if I move this a little bit, it will regenerate and get a slightly different result every single time. Sometimes it goes a little bit more out, sometimes it goes a little bit more in, but it's a lot more interesting. If you were to use this to spawn a road or have something move along this, it becomes a much more interesting setup. You don't have to just use one path. You can actually have paths connected to other paths. And as long as it has a viable way of getting from one to the other, you can actually just have it go from one to the other. So let's say I also want a, another path that goes from somewhere along this path to another point along this path. Well, we can go ahead and do that. I'll grab ourselves another pathfinding node and we'll sample the original grid because we want to be able to move all around the grid. So I'll use the extents modifier again as our input here. And I'll grab our two attribute filters and duplicate them down here as well. But instead of our in being from the extents modifier, I want to grab the the points from here. So if I drag this in, I can grab the points from our path, the first point and the last point of the path. Well, in our case, it's exactly the same. So doing this doesn't actually get us kind of anything interesting. Now we could uh, go ahead and just give it a specific value. Like we can have it start 10 units from the start and end 10 units from the end. And if I duplicate the debug, plug it in and change the debug red to let's say debug green. Well, you'll see it is mostly following the same path because the density and everything is all the same. So what we're gonna do is grab ourselves another attribute noise and I'm going to plug it in right before this in here for our new pathfinding. I change the seed and all of a sudden you're already getting a slightly different path. Now we are getting overlaps and we probably don't want these overlaps. So after this second pathfinding, once it has found all of the points, I can still use a difference node and cut out the old points. So the pathfinding second one will go into the source. The difference will be the original pathfinding here. And we can plug this into debug. And on the difference node, I'm gonna change from minimum to binary. And you can see here, we have now cut out everywhere where it was overlapping. The path is still there, but it is no longer overlapping. And you can see it tries to do both paths from one to the other, starting at the 10th point, the start and the end. Now, if I want it to be truly from a random point to a random point, instead of attribute filter and specifying the index, I can search for random choice. Now this gives us a random choice in our case, a fixed number of one, and that's exactly what we want. We want just a random single point. So instead of this attribute filter, we're going to use this chosen point. And to make sure that it chooses another random point, I'll go ahead and duplicate it again and use the discarded remaining points as our goal. And we can go ahead and remove this. So it picks one point and then picks a second different point the second time. And I'll change the seed on the second version as well. So now we have it going from here all the way through to this location. And if I go ahead and randomize it, you can see it is going between all these points. Now, if you want to prioritize the other way, you could absolutely prioritize the green over the red, but you now see you can get quite interesting results by combining different paths as such. You could absolutely use pathfinding in three dimensions. I'll go ahead and select all of this, just move it over to the side here, and then I'll take our PCG 2D pathfinding, I'll duplicate it and just rename it to 3D pathfinding, and I'll drag it out same as before, and open it up. So exact same graph, but in this case, we're not gonna use a create points grid. We're going to use our volume. So from here, I'm going to do a volume sampler. Voxel size will be 100, 100, 100 as before. That way we can keep our size in our pathfinding search distance 100 as well. And I'm gonna change the create points grid to be the out from our voxels. Very simple change. All of a sudden, as you can see, we're now getting three dimensional noise. If I move it a little bit, it'll recalculate. And just like that, we have a very interesting three-dimensional movement between two spots and another path going along it from one location to the next. And of course, just like before, you can absolutely use blockers inside of the 3D version, just like you can on the 2D one. Now you might be wondering, why is this interesting? What, why does this matter? It gets cool, but whether it's 2D or 3D, what is the practical use case of this? Aside from maybe putting some roads down, you could use this potentially to create full procedural 3D dungeon layouts, for example. This is a test world that I have, where inside this little area, it will create a single line that is always exactly 10 units long, and then it will create another one that has a little bit of a range that starts from somewhere else and ends up connecting to this point. 
Now, all of these are connected. There's just a little bit of gap there for visuals. But I hit simulate. It has created a new layout. Again, each one of these red is always 10 long. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And it always connects to a green path. If I go ahead and simulate again, it creates a new one that is always 10 in length. Simulate again. So every time I simulate, it goes ahead and creates a new one. It is set up to actually regenerate itself as many times as it needs to until it finds a suitable combination of points that gets you exactly 10 units in length and a connected path, which means that if you want a 3D dungeon or even a 2D dungeon, you can use something like this to all of a sudden spawn your rooms wherever these points are based on what is next to them now. And this is something I'm experimenting with to potentially make a 3D DCG dungeon generator that allows you to have verticality and different aspects of it. And if that's something you're interested in, please let me know in the comments below. But hopefully this is getting you thinking already about the possibilities just by using the pathfinding node. And keep in mind, you're getting a spline potentially as an output, which means you don't have to actually use it with PCG. You can just use the PCG nodes to create the spline and then have your AI follow the spline that it created. Now you're probably starting to think more about, hey, maybe when I have a person go to a different location, I can use a PCG graph to calculate the distance there, figure out what the best route is and create a spline and have them walk along the spline and it's no longer as boring as the straight line they would normally want. Now, as always, this project demo file is going to be available on my Patreon. We can join these wonderful people here in supporting what I do. It really means a lot. If you'd like to join our community, the link to the Discord will be down below as always. Then you can get to the patrons. And with 5.5 right around the corner, check out this video right here to see one of the new features possibly coming later this month.